So today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter number 16, King Chittaketu meets the Lord, text number 37. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Chitti Adibi Esha Kila Avrita Saptabhi Dasha Guna Uttarai Andakosha Yatra Patati Anukalpa Saha Andakoti Koti B Tat Ananta Shajandi Bereisha Kalavrita Satamdha Dasha Gunotarai Randa Kosha Yatapatatiyanu Kalpaha Sahanda Koti Koti Bishtarantaha Shajandi Bereisha Kalavrita Satambhya dasha gunotara randa kosha Yata patajyanu kalpaha Sahanda koti koti bishtarananta Chitti aribi By the ingredients of the material world headed by earth Aisha, this, Kila, indeed, Avrita, covered, Saptibi, seven, Dashaguna Uttarai, each ten times more than the previous one, Andakosha, egg shaped universe. Yatra, in whom Patati falls Anukalpa, like a minute atom. Saha, with Andakoti Koti B, millions of such universes. Tat, therefore, Ananta, you are called unlimited. Translation in purport, by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, the Savior of the whole universe, Ki Jai. Each universe is covered by seven layers, earth, water, fire, air, sky, the total energy and false ego, each ten times greater than the previous one. There are innumerable universes besides this one, and although they are unlimitedly large, they move about like atoms in you. Therefore, you are called unlimited ananta, purport. The Brahma Samhita 548 says, Yashyaika <laughs> Vishnu Mahansa Yeyashakala Vishesho Govinda Madhi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. The origin of the material creation is Mahavishnu, who lies in the causal ocean. While he sleeps in that ocean, 
millions of universes are generated as he exhales and they are all annihilated when he inhales. This Mahavishnu is a plenary portion of a portion of Vishnu, Govinda, Yesha Kala Vishesha. The word Kala refers to a plenary portion of a plenary portion. From Krishna or Govinda comes Balaram. From Balaram comes Sankarshan. From Sankarshan, Narayan. From Narayan, the second Sankarshan. From the second Sankarshan, Mahavishnu. From Mahavishnu, Gavadakashai Vishnu. And from Gavadakashai Vishnu, Chiradakashai Vishnu. Chiradakashai Vishnu controls every universe. This gives an idea of the meaning of Ananta, unlimited. What is to be said of the unlimited potency in the existence of the Lord? This verse describes the coverings of the universe, Saptabdir Dasha Gunottara Kosha. The first covering is earth, the second is water, the third is fire, the fourth is air, the fifth is sky, and the sixth is the total material energy, and the seventh is the false ego. Beginning with the covering of earth, each covering is ten times greater than the previous one. Thus we can only imagine how great each universe is. And there are many millions of universes as confirmed by the Lord himself in Bhagavad Gita 10.42 Atava bahunaitena kim gitena tvadarjana vishabhyaham midam krishnam ekang shenasti tojagat but what need is there, Arjuna, for all of this detail of knowledge with a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support this entire universe. The entire material world manifests only one-fourth of the Supreme Lord's energy. Therefore, he is called Ananta. Vandeha. Shri Guru Shri Jata Balakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Shri Rupa Sagrajatan Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivan Sadaitan Savadutan Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Deva Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Lalita Sri Vishakon Vitam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Svaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasvate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Pretty thick walls. Just imagine if you're living in a prison and each wall of the prison was ten times wider than the previous one and there were seven walls. Very, very thick walls. 
you can't break out. You see, the Mayavadis try to do that. They think we can, by our own strength we can break out. You see, by my gyan I can conquer Maya. Krishna is very kind to these Mayavadis. He lets them think they're liberated for some time. Aruya Krishna Padam 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 Yad. But Patanti Yad Ho, they fall back down into this material existence. Become a taxi driver in Delhi. You see? So you're not going to make it by Gyan, Prabhu. Madhaji, you're not going to make it by Gyan. There's only one way out of this nasty, horrible place, and that is bhakti. Don't think otherwise. Just try to understand how great is God. With an expansion of 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 himself, he is manifesting all these millions and billions of universes and at the same time he's situated within every atom and between every atom. So you might as well kick out this idea that you're God. Just kick it out right now. The so-called books on self-realization out in the market nowadays, they teach you that you're a God. I know I was a victim of such books previously sometimes known as hippie philosophy. I'm God, you're God, we're all God. What kind of gods are we? When nature calls, we have to run to the toilet and we think that we're God. So we have to understand our position. We have to clearly, without any confusion, delusion, we have to clearly understand what is our position. So mercifully explained to us by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Jivera Svarupakhoi Krishnera Nichidas, the constitutional position of the living entity is that he is the eternal servant of Krishna. That's actual liberation. When you can realize and understand that you're the eternal servant of Krishna, you're liberated. So how does one get that understanding? Not difficult. You don't have to be a big scholar. You don't need to have 25 PhD degrees. All you have to do is hear submissively from the bona fide spiritual master. That's all. He simply tells you, you are the eternal servant of Krishna. Don't think otherwise. Kick out any other ideas about being this or that in this material world. Just kick them all out right now. That's what he tells us, you see. Kick them all out right now. Simply understand who you really are, you see. It's not difficult. You don't have to stand on your head. You don't have to do anything except realize you're the eternal servant of Krishna and just be who you really are. Our philosophy is so simple. Know who you are and be who you are. It's the most simple thing you could ever imagine, but we make it complicated because of our cheating mentality. We want to somehow still be the center of existence. I always felt I was the center of existence. I just know I have to be the center of existence. You see, this, this is called the false ego. I am the center. Kick it out. But I want to be in the center. Kick it out. And we put Krishna back in the center, then everything becomes perfect becomes wonderful, becomes 
absolutely inconceivably sublime when we put Krishna back in the center. Simple example. The hand thinks, why should I feed the stomach? I have this nice glove jam in here. Why well, should share it with my stomach? I will enjoy it separately. You see. Can that hand enjoy the glove jam? Not possible. You might think you're enjoying it by squeezing it between the fingers, having all that juice ooze down your wrist. You may think you're enjoying that glove jam. But no, you're not really enjoying that glove jam, sir. You want to enjoy that glove jam and pop it in your mouth. That's where it goes to the belly. Then you'll enjoy. So our foolish attempts to enjoy separately of God is like trying to enjoy a glove jam by squeezing it in your fingers. That's our stupidity. That's our asinineness. That we're trying to enjoy separately from Krishna. It just doesn't work. We've been trying for millions and billions of lifetimes to pull it off, but it doesn't work. We've tried as Brahma, that didn't work. We tried as Indra, that didn't work. We went hopping, hopping, hopping. We went body hopping through millions and millions of forms all the way down to Indra Gopa and it still didn't work. It didn't work. But now somehow or other, by the grace of the Supreme, we have human bodies. And we have sufficient intelligence to realize not to be idiots. But if we don't realize it, we're idiots. Sometimes one may come, become very depressed. Well, how is it possible I could ever get out of this quagmire? I've been trying to enjoy, enjoy. I still want to enjoy. How am I ever going to get out of it? Even I come to Vrindavan and I think I'm enjoying my senses. How can I get out of this quagmire? Is it possible I'll ever be liberated from this madness? One might get bewildered sometimes. Prabhupada very nicely explains in the teachings of Lord Chaitanya that there's every possibility of being liberated. Just like the logs flowing down the river, there's every possibility that log can, get, can brush up against the shore and get out of the flow, you see. So we are compared by the Bhagavatam to logs floating down the river, you see. Somehow or other we need to get out of that flow of the material nature and get over to the bank, spiritual life. That's the simile given in Bhagavatam. So how does one get out of the flow of the material nature? It's very simple. You simply have to come in contact with the pure devotees of the Lord. It's very simple. You just come in contact with Krishna's pure devotees. Very simple formula. That's the whole point of ISKCON. Prabhupada's vision was to create a movement of pure devotees. Not Kanishta Adhikaris trying to enjoy the material world and be a little pious while they're trying to enjoy. No. Prabhupada's vision of ISKCON is a society of pure devotees. You see? Completely absorbed in pure bhakti. So we should not disappoint Prabhupada by hanging on to our material desires. We should, in fact, strive for pure bhakti. Prabhupada wrote me one very nice letter. He told me that by this pure bhakti, that Krishna would become visible to me face to face. Can you imagine actually being able to see Krishna? Well, it's possible. If we give up our material attachments, our material desires, our material consciousness, and we fully embrace pure devotional service as our only desire, and we're very serious and intense about it, and we maintain that day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, we can achieve that state where Krishna actually becomes visible. Premanjana charita bhakti velochanena Santaksadai Vrahida Yeshiva Lokayanti Yang Shama Shunda Ramachet Yagunasva Rupam Govindamadi Purusham Tamaham Vajami I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Sham Sundar, Krishna himself, with inconceivable 
innumerable attributes whom the pure devotees see in their heart of hearts with the eye of devotion tinged with the salve of love. So, that's what we need. We need some of that premanjana. As I many times explained before, our Srila Prabhupada, what was his occupation before he started this kind of pharmaceutical business, yes? So many medicines. Well, Prabhupada did not give up the pharmaceutical business. This kind is actually a pharmacy, but there's only one medicine here in this pharmacy. Premanjana, the ointment of love of God. Prabhupada simply eliminated all the other medicines. Now there's only one medicine. The Iskan pharmacy has one medicine only, Premanjana. It's interesting, the, the connection between Sanskrit and English. Prabhupada explains actually that Sanskrit is the, the origin of all the modern languages. You see. It, ointment has another word, and it's not very common, but unguent is another word for ointment. Notice the difference, the similarity, I mean to say, between anjana and unguent. So the prem unguent, prem anjana, is available here in this camp. From his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, and from those who are purely representing Srila Prabhupada without any material motives. Premanjana. So how do you apply this ointment anyway? They come in a tube? Usually ointments come in a tube. How do you, how do you apply it? How do you get it? Well, this is a very interesting ointment. It doesn't come in a tube. It comes in the form of Shabda Brahma, transcendental sound vibration. So how do you apply it? Well, it's interesting. This eye ointment is applied through the ears. You have to take the Shabda Brahma very deep, deep, or I can say deeply, deeply, deeply into your ears to where it actually penetrates the core of your heart. You see. And then it manifests in your vision. That's how you apply the Premanjana. You have to take it through the ears by submissive hearing. Therefore, of all the processes given the Navavita Bhakti, the nine processes of Bhakti, this hearing is the most important thing. You have to find those persons who are purely presenting the message of the Parampara, who are not adding sense gratification, subtle or gross, to it. They're not compromising with sense gratification on any level. Those persons who are purely presenting the parampara message, you see. It could be a sannyasi, a householder, a vanaprastha, a brahmachari, it doesn't matter the ashram. It doesn't matter the occupation. Maybe a full-time preacher, they might be a businessman, maybe a housewife or a kid in school. It doesn't matter the externals. What matters is who is purely presenting the teachings of Krishna without any motive, without any adulteration, you see. If we hear from such devotees, and there are many such devotees in our society, you see. If we hear from such devotees and take that message deeply, deeply, deeply into our hearts, then we become mystically transformed. Our whole consciousness is completely our original pure consciousness of being the eternal servant of Krishna becomes rejuvenated. It's already there. You have it within you. You simply have to wake it up. This other thing, the tendency to enjoy the material world is an artificial imposition on your mind imposed by the material nature that you embrace millions and billions and trillions and quadrillions of lifetimes ago when you foolishly wanted to try to imitate Krishna. So now, take advantage of this process. Take advantage of the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and his pure representatives. Free yourself from this once and for all. Just kick it out and say, Maya, I've had enough with you. The affair is over. We're breaking up. That's it. You're out. Now I only have one love, and that's Krishna. I have no love except for Krishna. 
Remember when I joined ISKCON, one of the senior devotees said, you're not supposed to love devotees, you're only supposed to love Krishna. And I was going, what? Because I'd been, I'd been recruited by Vishnu John Swami. He was so loving and he was just full of love. He was the most loving uh, person you could ever imagine, Vishnu John Swami. Prabhupada said, because he is such a nice devotee, therefore he's creating nice devotees. So I thought a little weird when I was told, you're not supposed to love devotees. I mean, are you kidding? He's a senior devotee, I couldn't say anything, you know. But then a few years later, I got a, a Xerox copy of a new book that was soon to be published by ISKCON called the Upadesh Amrita. And I looked and there it was, loving the devotees. Wow, I knew it was right. You are supposed to love devotees. We're not impersonalists here. You're supposed to love devotees. I was so happy. Wow, it's cool. It's, it's bona fide to love a Vaishnava. It's not Maya. I was so happy to hear that, you see. Because the fact is, as confirmed in the Adi Purana, ye me bhakta jana parata, na me bhakta shtate janaha, mad bhaktanam chi ye bhaktas, te me bhakta tamamata. Krishna is telling Arjun, he says, my dear Arjun, the one who is my devotee, he's not my devotee. Whoa. No me bhaktas, he says, he's not my devotee, but the devotee of my devotee. He is my devotee. You see. So there you have it. This is how you can get that premanjana, you see. Because the more you develop loving relationships with Vaishnavas, the more you become attracted to the association of Vaishnavas, you see. You become less and less attracted by the charms of Sri Bhatti Mayadevi, you see. So we have to become addicted to Vaishnava Sangha. The more I love the devotees, the more I relish their association, the more I hanker for them. Just like Prabhupada's sister. She was also his god sister, by the way, Prishima. She said, she was, her mood was, Vaishnavas are my life. What will you eat? What will you eat? She simply wanted to serve the Vaishnavas. You see? That mood, I just want to serve the Vaishnavas. This, this is pure bhakti mood actually. Because Krishna is not so interested to see how much eager you are to serve Him. He wants to see how much eager you are to serve His devotees. When you have this mood, this loving and serving the Vaishnavas, then your heart becomes very, very soft. And that's the condition you need to be in to get that premanjana, you see. That's the position you need to be in. So take advantage of this process. Don't cheat yourself, Prabhus, Maharaj, Madhajis. Don't cheat yourself. Take exactly what Prabhupada is giving and don't water it down with any type of sense gratification. It's a tendency now I see. It's like Prabhupada said, householders should have only sex only for procreation. Devotees said, no, it's okay, householders can have sex outside of procreation. Where does this come from? This is nonsense. Prabhupada clearly states in many, many places, sex life is only for procreation. Why we should change Prabhupada's instructions and pollute our society with bogus philosophy? Doesn't make any sense. Keep it pure. I guarantee you, Hare Krishna is better than sex. Try Hare Krishna. It's better than sex. I mean, who, who needs to have sex when you got Hare Krishna? You see, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Why is it better than sex? Because it reconnects you with the Supreme Personality of God, the source of everything. Does sex do that? No. Sex simply reconnects you with your body, that's all it does. It simply brings you back to bodily consciousness. Hare Krishna brings you to the transcendental plane. It's interesting in this connection. When I was a young brahmachari, way back in about 73 in Miami, one householder couple approached me and the husband said, uh, Oh Sankarshan Prabhu, I just wanted to share something with you. My wife and I were following Prabhupada's program, you know, to chant 50 rounds once in a month before having sex or having a kid. And uh, 
So my wife and I last night, we chanted 50 rounds and after we finished the japa, we said, wow, we're feeling so enlivened by Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Let's wait till next month before we have sex. They, they were all, they, they chanted Hare Krishna to prepare themselves for trying to, you know, bring a child in the world. They were so enlivened. They said, nah, why, who wants to come out of the bodily plane? By having sex, forget it. It's Hare Krishna is better than sex, you see. I thought that was very, very nice. It was very enlivened to hear that. It encouraged me in my brahmacharya life. You hear the householder saying that. It's a fact. You don't need to get married. And if you're married, you don't need to have sex. I've never had sex. You see, I got married. I never. I just went straight to Vanaprastha life, you know. A fast track. <laughs> Why mess around? Of course, having saintly children is also good. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati said he's prepared to have sex 100 times if he can produce saintly children. But you don't have to. A house order has a choice. They can have kids or they can have kids by preaching. You see. I have, uh, I could have, got, I could, my, my wife and I could have had sex and had two or three kids, but instead we preach and I have 230 children now, you see, disciples. That's so himself that proves you that Hare Krishna is better than sex. That having sex, I'm, preaching is a greater sex life, you see. I have over 200 children now, my wife and I have 200 kids by preaching, you see. So if we understand uh, that we don't really need to, to compromise in any way, we just stick, we stick strictly to what Prabhupada has given, then we qualify ourselves for that premanjana. And we will actually reach that point where Krishna will become revealed to us. Even before we leave our present body, it's possible to have Krishna's darshan. You see, it's possible. If we embrace fully this process, totally, fully embrace it with no compromises. So now I can ask if there's any questions. I have some written questions coming. It's easier because I'm a little hard of hearing. How? Huh? Can one recognize a pure devotee? Well, you have to read Prabhupada's books and see who is purely preaching and living what's in the books. Prabhupada's books are the standard of what is pure devotion and Prabhupada's example is the standard of what is pure devotion. You judge everything by Prabhupada and by Prabhupada's books. Is there, uh, is there a need, any quality, is there need, any quality associates this question doesn't make sense. Is there need any quality associate with pure devotee? That's incorrect grammar. Okay. Okay, false ego is, uh, someone did the, the math on it, is one million layer thickness. But earth is so gross and false ego is so subtle, so how can you understand that false ego is this much thicker than the earth? Is this analogy a, a real measurement? Is this an analogy a real measurement? No, this is a real measurement, it's not an analogy. And the fact is the false ego is the trickiest thing of all. You see? It's the trickiest thing of all. It's like the Maya bodies. They, a uh, very staunch Maya body, rejects the bodily concept, but he can't get beyond the false ego. The false ego is the heaviest trap of them all. The heaviest wall or barrier of all is the false ego. You see, that's why the Maya bodies and the yogis, even though they're very austere in relation to their body, that false ego is still a problem for them. So comparing with the soul, it says that one, it, how can I chant Hare Krishna that it takes, uh, that it, all these layers can cut through very quickly? It's very simple. If you chant Hare Krishna purely, immediately, boom, you can cut through all the layers. This is called Mantra Vimana. Hare, the Mantra airplane will actually carry you through the coverings very quickly. Just like the example we see of Dhruva Maharaj, the Vaikuntha airplane came. Those Vaikuntha airplanes have no difficulty cutting through all the layers. They have a special pass that allows them to break through the layers. It's not even an effort. effort effort effortlessly, they pass through the coverings. 
And on the way through, you can check it out. Wow, it is pretty thick. As you go through those coverings, you go, man, it's really amazing. Jesus, shh. But it's very quickly one passes through the covering. Anyone have a question about raising the hand? It's also there. But see, how to develop the mood of chanting for the pleasure of Krishna and Guru? Well, in the beginning we chant because we want to get out of our hellish, nightmarish situation in the, in the material existence. We chant for our own liberation. But gradually we realize that, um, let me chant to please Krishna. Because actually the more you develop that mood, you're already beyond the material existence. You see? If I'm thinking, let me sing and, or chant in such a way that Krishna is pleased, I'm already in, that puts me already in the spiritual world because that's the world where everything is done for the pleasure of Guru and Krishna. How can one consider himself most fallen and most incompetent fool and at the same time be enthusiastic in service? That's a really nice question. Well, it really boils down to this. You're thinking it's something contradictory. That's a mistake. You, you don't understand correctly. Actually, the more you feel you're an incompetent fool, rascal number one, that's when you become more enthusiastic, presumably. It's not like there's some contradictory, uh, you know, things you have to deal with here. The more you feel fallen and lowly and absolutely dependent on the mercy of Guru and Krishna to get, out of your, get you out of your quagmire, that's what will make you enthusiastic. It's not that humility uh, is, uh, bleeds away your enthusiasm. See, in the material world, we're enthusiastic in the mode of passion. So this is enthusiasm in the mode of goodness. It's a little more, it's more subtle, but just have faith in it, embrace it. In the beginning, it will seem a little hard. Wow, I just got heavily chastised. I just feel like going in the corner and, and cry, having a good cry. I, say, I got heavily chastised. But actually, you should think how much I've been blessed. Prabhupada said, the student who is more chastised, he is advanced. So the more you can be put in your place, that you're just an insignificant rascal fool number one, that's actually the greatest mercy you could ever have. You see, you have to learn to appreciate the mercy of being put in your place by, the, by your spiritual master or by senior devotees or even your god brothers or god sisters. You see, may sometimes remind you what a fool and rascal you actually are. So the more you can feel yourself very lowly and fallen, that's how you become actually empowered to take over the world for Prabhupada. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Wow, we gotta hurry now. Um, too many questions coming in. Is there any difference between the bodily conception of life and the false ego? They are, the, bodily, the false ego puts you in the bodily conception of life. But even if you're beyond the bodily conception, if you think you're, you're just a spirit soul, but you think that, you, that you, are, you are the same as God, the false ego can also be uh, in the subtle plane as well. Okay, sometimes when we are, when we are in a position uh, to think that we are the controller, but Krishna is, Krishna is, Krishna is though, and we know that we are servant, the servant. I don't understand the question. Okay. Um, Srila Prabhupada has given the instruction of once in a year, a life member can stay in the temple, three days free. The current GBC changed this rules. How can I understand? Or write to another GBC, because they can't change the rules. <laughs> How to make devotee relationship more meaningful? Usually we associate with each other for sense gratification. Uh, 
um, you have to understand, let me do what is beneficial for my Krishna consciousness and for your Krishna consciousness. That should be the basis of our any relationship. Otherwise, it's mundane. What deviations do you see in this kind are trying to creep in? Well, I don't know if I should say it. I may get in trouble if I get only reveal my heart here. All <laughs> the deviations I see may offend some devotees. Um, I don't want to do that. Um, there are many deviations creeping into our society. And um, I, this is something I'd better discuss privately. I don't want to. I may, some devotees may be offended if I start saying things that I see are wrong in our society right now. They may, one time I did that in, in a, uh, I put an essay on uh, Krishna, dot, what is it? The ISKCON, uh, ISKCON news site. And somebody wrote me back and said, why don't you mind your own business? They're really offended by, that I would point out some of the discrepancies in ISKCON. Because I had stepped on his toe, something that he was attached to. So I don't want to step any toe. I don't want to step on any toes here in Vrindavan. Even if I see that you're deviating uh, from Prabhupada, still I have all respect for you. And I pray that whatever deviations may be there, you can rectify them. And I pray that my deviations can also be rectified. But I don't want to publicly just start saying things because I, one devotee was very, very, not a god brother, but very, very offended at me that I would dare to point out uh, one deviation that he was attached to. <laughs> okay. We are happy with our wife to live without children, but devotees are telling us that family life is without children is useless. How to understand? Well, then just be a vanaprastha then. <laughs> just tell them, I'm, I'm not grihastha, I'm vanaprastha. That's all you got to do. <laughs> I'm not grihastha, I'm vanaprastha. <laughs> Simple thing. <laughs> There is a statement of Chanakya Pandit that a household life without children is like a desert, as of them. But I'm not a householder, I'm a grihast, I'm a vanaprastha. That's all you have to do, say I'm vanaprastha. No problem, Prabhu, I'm vanaprastha. <laughs> okay, so, any last questions? There's no more questions, we can stop here, but I want to encourage everybody to take this process very seriously. Don't mess around with the material nature. One devotee wrote me, he said, well, um, whatever, is it, whatever little progress I make, is it my eternal asset? So is it okay if I just make a little progress? I said, why cheat yourself? Why should you think, well, you know, whatever I do, it's my eternal asset, so I'll just gradually, gradually become a devotee. How do you know you're not even being an animal in your next life if you're hanging on to material desires? Finish your business now, that's intelligent. If fully embrace your bhakti now, you see. Get out while well, the getting's good. You got a human body, you're, you're connected with the pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada, and the pure representatives of Srila Prabhupada. Take advantage of this situation, get out now. You see. Confirmed by the bell. Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.